Hello, and welcome to Ask the Pro season three, episode number 25. Um, in this episode, we will go over RO system basics. This presentation is for informal purposes only. The views and opinions expressed in this webcast are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any aspect of the Specialty Coffee Association or the companies the panelists may represent. Mm -hmm. We need a comma or a period in there somewhere. I'm not sure which yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, kind of, it's kind of the world's longest run on sites. <laughs> uh, blame blame Mythbusters. Like, I, I stole it from Mythbusters. <laughs> as I said, this is the third season, and we're committed to pre uh, presenting these episodes throughout the year, so save Fridays at 8 for the Coffee Tech Guild. Um, what we'd like to do next is uh, do a short introduction, and, and um, if, you're, if you're having coffee, tell us what you're having. If you're not having coffee, uh, maybe just share what your favorite coffee is. And so I'll start. I'm, I'm having a nice Honduran that I got from the grocery store yesterday. Uh, this is a honey um, processed, and I made it with, um, I made a pour over, a 16 to 1 ratio. Um, this one, it, it had like an aroma of Fruit Loops. What, am I going too far? No, you're good, Caleb. You're good. <laughs> uh I, I like the smell was like fruit loops it was really bright and fruity um and it, it has a nice sweetness to it but it's also got like really thick tannins on the finish so i've got this like dry kind of sucked out um uh, the moisture by mouth afterwards um but you know ultimately a delicious coffee and i really wanted because this episode is about filtration i wanted to see like okay it's been a while since i've tested my water at home and uh, so I started digging out my tools because I don't do this as regularly as I used to. TDS <laughs> meter, um, and I couldn't find any of I couldn't find my tritration kit uh, or any strips. So I just looked up the most recent hardness uh, tests around me, and what I'm at is around 50 TDS and around between two and five hardness in Tacoma. But what I do notice mostly is that in the summer I can taste more chlorine. So. We can dig into that a little bit further, but I'm going to just go down the road here. So, Gary, would you mind uh, doing a quick introduction and, you know, tell us what what uh, kind of coffee you like or what you're drinking? Cool. Um, my name is Gary Nord. Uh, I'm based in the UK. I work for Britta. Um, and today I am drinking some coffee. Actually, my daughter bought me yesterday. It's uh, by a small roastery in uh, Maidenhead uh, in the UK, west of London, called Barista Cats. Um, I can't tell you the sauce because it doesn't talk about that, but it's delicious. And um, when I make mine, it is made with uh, French press. Nice. Thanks, Gary. Scott? Now, I'm having an Americano. Uh, it's a uh, coffee by a local roaster called Jamelli. It's a really uh, traditional, old school uh, Northwest uh, espresso. Um, nice. Very, very Seattle. Um, and uh yeah all right we'll hear a little bit more from you scott in just a minute kurt can you do a short introduction uh just kurt benedict own and operate uh last man we do espresso machine service repair out in denver colorado uh and this morning i'm actually drinking a nice guatemalan from elevation roasters here in town it's a local guy nice best for last highland uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, my name is Hyland Joseph. I'm West Coast Service Manager. <clears throat> Sorry for Espresso Partners. I'm currently at my dad's house drinking Boomer coffee, so I don't know what kind of coffee my dad makes, but I think if I poured this into a car, it might actually drive the car. <laughs> not, only, not only is it killing me because it's so strong, it's like my teeth feel clean and coffee flavored now. <laughs> But I think I think it's actually a bag of that um, mighty good coffee that I sent him. But it's like, oh my God, I'm gonna go clean acid off all of the battery with this coffee. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. Well, um, I, I forgot to mention I'm I work for Starbucks as the equipment service manager. So, um, Scott, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to you and and let you do the presentation. Then uh, when we get get through that, we'll uh, we'll move on to questions and you know panel uh, activity. So. Thanks, Scott. See you on the other side. Thanks, Caleb. I got control of the uh, the slides, and I'll I'll just advance them over here. So, um, cool. Let well, me know if you need anything. 
Thank you. Thank you. Probably will. Um, well, welcome everybody to episode 25 of RO System Basics. You may see me glancing to my right or my left, depending on how the camera looks, because uh, I've got the presentation to the other side of me. So I got to look over and see where I'm at every once in a while, but um, hopefully this will go well. <laughs> so um, I am. Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, presented by me, Scott Manley. I'm the technical support manager for La Marzuka USA and Modbar. I'm also the water quality specialist. Uh, my background is working for large and small coffee roasters, as well as one of the country's largest manufacturers of water conditioning equipment in my, my past life, and I'm here now. Uh, I'd really like to say thank you to the SCA and the Coffee Technicians Guild for having me and putting this on. And, uh, and all the wonderful people who are here today as panelists. Um, I really appreciate the, the support that the Coffee Technicians Guild uh, does give and provide out there. So uh, it's really great to see this all coming together. Um, like I said, I work for La Marzocco and they're the people who are, are uh, uh, allowing me to be here. And uh, uh, I also do consulting work on the side to uh, calibrated water. So um, getting right into this RO system basics this is going to be an introduction uh, to the RO system and very specifically focused on what an RO is and not maybe uh, some of the parts and components that come before and after um, it's not going to get super technical because we're starting kind of from the beginning here we're going to go over what is reverse osmosis and kind of discuss how it works what's it for who needs an RO system? Does everyone need an RO system? And I know some people who probably tuned into this are thinking, I've talked to Scott before. He always recommends RO, and that's absolutely not true. But usually when you're dealing with a very specific water problem, RO can oftentimes be the answer, but it's not the only answer. Um, so we're going to then discuss a little bit about who installs and maintains RO systems. So you know, where do you go to get one of these things and how are you going to take care of it? And then some pros and cons of RO, because there are upsides and downsides. And you may find yourself in a situation where you actually have a choice. Like RO is an answer, but maybe there's something else that's also an answer. So it's not the be all and end all. So what is it? Reverse osmosis is a water purif purification process that uses semi-permeable membranes to separate ions and dissolve solids from drinking water. It's a membrane separation technology, and uh, it's, it's a common, well-developed technology that's been in place for actually close to 100 years. It was only commercialized, though, in the late 1960s when manufacturing processes, uh, advancements, made it possible to mass produce these things. Prior to that, it, it, they were very special and unique in large industrial type installations, and it was in the late 1960s that somebody developed what we are familiar with now, which is the spiral round membrane. And that's what made it possible to, uh, to you know, heavily commercialize it. Just a little bit of history there. So how does RO really work though? So like I said, it takes um, your water, your pre-filtered water, and it separates it into two streams. This is how it actually removes minerals from water. You've got a, a, a tightly wrapped uh, fabric, um, as you can see in the picture in the slide, that um, controls the flow of water and passes that, and some of that water is gonna pass through that membrane, and basically only water is gonna pass through. Uh, and the rest of it will concentrate what's left in the water and flush it down the drain. And so the incoming feed water is sometimes called source water or um, local water, municipal water, it's separated into two streams, concentrate, which is the wastewater, and permeate, which is your purified water. Now, do you need RO? This is, you know, kind of the question that everybody really comes to. And if they talk to me, like I said, they probably have heard me recommend it more than once for a particular situation. But just know that each you know, CAFE is going to have a unique set of circumstances or, or issues or concerns that they need to address. And RO is a great tool, but it's not, a you know, it's not a default answer. And how we get to 
understanding if we need a reverse osmosis system is through testing our water. So ideally, you want to start with um, getting an accurate water test and getting as much information about the water that you're going to be using throughout the year. And that may include getting information from your local water department or from another resource like somebody who does water filtration in your area. Um, once you've established what's in your water, then with proper evaluation, you can determine whether an RO system is going to be the best solution for whatever you're finding that's in your water. And just to make a note of this, there are no water filters that are specifically for coffee equipment. I, uh, not to pick on any manufacturer in this, because I understand that a lot of that's just marketing. Um, but when you see something that says for coffee equipment or for brewers or for coffee, um, just you know, use a little caution on that. Test your water first and determine if that particular technology, like RO, is appropriate for the situation that you have. Because ideally, while RO is great and it does wonderful things, it also is kind of, you know, there's some cost to it. And when you need to spend that cost, it'll actually save you money down the road on your equipment. But uh, if you don't need to, it's, it's kind of a waste. So there are two primary applications for RO in the CAFE setting, two things that we use it for. The first is to demineralize water. So if you've got too much calcium, magnesium, bicarbonate in your water, um, that's gonna cause scaling, you know, nuisance reactive calls for your equipment and cause downtime, an RO is an effective way of demineralizing water or basically removing uh, excess substances that can cause scaling issues. Uh, that's probably the most common application that we see. Now, it's not the only way to remove scale, but it does allow us a certain measure of control um, in determining the final product water. It's, it's easier to get to a certain point if you have a lot of calcium or magnesium or bicarbonate in your water to use reverse osmosis to reduce it to a level that is repeatable. The second reason why reverse osmosis is employed is for corrosive water. So if you have water that has high chlorides, which we've talked about chlorides, or really high sulfates, um, an RO system is going to be your best solution in that situation. Now, it's not the only way to remove chlorides from water. I worked in industrial water systems prior to doing this for a period of time, and there are other solutions out there. Um, most of them are for situations where you're not going to be drinking the final product water, so they're really not applicable. And there are some other solutions out there that also work, but they tend to be less reliable and less predictable in terms of their outcome than reverse osmosis. It's a very developed technology and it's very mature. couple other notes about reverse osmosis is it's, and I've sort of alluded to this, is it's a non-selective form of TDS removal, meaning that it doesn't pick anions or cations or any particular uh, uh, dissolved salt. It just basically removes all of them. Now, the membranes in standard RO systems that we'd be using in cafes, they're made of polyamide. They have a slight anionic charge, and this is getting a little bit technical here. But they, because of that anionic charge, they tend to attract cations, water hardness. So they do, it does pose a slight limitation there. They don't dissolve, they don't remove dissolved gases from water. That's another point. Um, although generally that's not something we're really paying attention to. And because you're going to have some form of standard carbon filtration before your RO system, it's going to take care of most of that. Another thing I wanted to address was that RO systems don't directly affect the pH of water or alter the pH of water. They do remove bicarbonate, which is alkalinity. Alkalinity is the ability of, of uh, to uh, stabilize pH in water so it doesn't shift around, um, but it doesn't actually make water acidic, and that's a huge myth that keeps getting perpetuated. Um, so just wanted to address that. Um, the permeate is generally conductive from an RO system, at least in the RO systems that we use for cafes, which are small light industrial systems. Um, it's not complete, really completely pure water from an industrial standpoint or a laboratory standpoint. That doesn't mean that straight RO water makes the best coffee. It's just that you know you can run 
uh, coffee equipment on fairly pure water, and that actually isn't an issue for the equipment. That's just something to, to note. So, installation and maintenance. Um, kind of like, how do you get an RO system and who takes care of that? Well, I would recommend going with, it, with technicians who are trained and knowledgeable. That hopefully is your coffee equipment technician. Um, and we're at the Coffee Technicians Guild, we're all working towards that. Um, if not, it might be somebody else in, the, in an allied industry who works specifically with water filtration. And, and sometimes you really need a specialist. Um, you also wanna make sure that whoever you're working with, you know has the testing tools to properly verify operation. So at the very minimum, a TDS meter. Um, as a matter of fact, that's one of the advantages of reverse osmosis because it's non-selective. You can use a non-selective measurement tool like a TDS meter to verify the efficacy of the system. You also wanna work with somebody who actually can supply spare parts and filters. Uh, somebody who carries components and doesn't, uh, doesn't have to constantly uh, drop ship order stuff because uh, most of the stuff isn't terribly expensive to inventory at least in small enough quantities um, Somebody who has coffee knowledge. I think that's an important thing to know, right? I mean uh, The guy who sells filters for the swimming pool may not be the best person to advise you on the water for your coffee And I know this is getting a little off topic from specifically reverse osmosis basics, but it's a part of that initial conversation that you're gonna have with somebody regarding the system you may be purchasing. So I just wanted to get that in there. The other one is like maintains good documentation. Something I'm always you know, encouraging people to do is to document uh, how you're uh, maintaining the system and what your water quality is. And we all should hopefully be doing that because in the end, it's gonna contribute to having really tasty coffee and that's why we're all here. So let's go over some pros and cons of reverse osmosis systems. As I've stated, one of the main pros is predictability. Predictability is when an RO system is installed and maintained properly, you can be pretty confident that a year from now it's still going to be working, assuming nothing really bad happens in the meantime, like you know uh, something with your water system or an outbreak of something where it forces you to change out everything in your system and disinfectant. It's generally going to work pretty well. I say that with 20 years of experience working on RO systems for cafes. I feel real solid about that. Second is reliability. They're very reliable at what they do. As long as the, like I said, maintenance is done and things are checked, they, they work really well compared to other technologies because they are pretty easy to verify. The non-selectivity of the system makes verification simple, as, as I said previously, makes it, you know, you're not having to pull out a chemistry set just to see if your RO is working. You can verify pretty easily with a handheld TDS meter and have, you know, assurance that it's working or not. Low annualized cost if properly installed and maintained. Generally speaking, RO systems only really require the pre-filters to be changed and maybe some adjustment of uh, pressure or waste drain ratio stuff, you know, some minor adjustments. And if that's maintained, the cost isn't really too high. It's obviously higher because you probably will have to have a technician than say just basic carbon filtration. But, you know, if you have an RO system, you're probably dealing with some issues that kind of go beyond basic water knowledge. So there's that. Cons, and this is, you know, there's there's generally a lot of stuff out there that people have in terms of opinions about why RO is bad. Um, I mentioned previously acidic water. There's a huge belief that RO systems somehow create acidic water. It's absolutely not true from a chemistry standpoint. I can say that. Um, cons are though high upfront costs. Depending on the, you know, volume of water you need and how bad or how difficult it is to treat that water, you may be spending a, a pretty solid chunk of change to remediate those issues. Now, balanced out against the cost to repair your equipment, it's almost always less expensive to fix the water. So, and I say that as I manage a tech support team that deals with warranty for a manufacturer and, you know, as the saying goes, 70% of the issues we have with equipment are all water related at some point, so. There's a balance there. Um, there is complex installation. RO systems, of course, generally require water in, water out, and a drain. Um, they may require electrical work. They may require some unique plumbing solutions as well, depending upon your installation uh, in your cafe. Um, and they do take up some space. So you've got to allocate or give up some space if you're in an existing location 
uh, to dedicate to this system, and that can present its own set of challenges. Wasted water is another one that I hear quite frequently, and that is true. RO systems use water to make water. Now, the numbers you might see on the internet of you know wasting 10 gallons to one are generally not true. Uh, that's there's something wrong with your RO system if it's that bad. And you know, 40, 50 years ago when these things came onto the market, yeah, water wastage was pretty high. It wasn't actually an initial concern. Um, it wasn't thought of the way it is now. But but times have changed, and the and the technology around RO systems has advanced considerably. Um, modern RO systems can can actually produce more water than they waste. Um, you know, inexpensive stuff you buy off of Amazon probably still wastes like three to four gallons for every one gallon it makes, but that's maybe not something we're going to use in our cafe. You might use it in your home because you're not using very much water and that amount of wastage isn't that high, but in a cafe it is. So I, it's worth investigating exactly how much water does this use and, and factor that in, that cost. So that is a con. It's going to use more water. And depending on what part of the country you're in, you know, your water costs may be higher or lower. Um... Qualified service providers are actually limited. This is one of the things we're addressing with this series is to get more information out about RO systems and hopefully get more people who are in the coffee industry interested in water technology. But as it stands now, although the water industry is vast, it's a huge, you know, I worked for one of the largest manufacturers in the world at one time. Um, water for coffee is just a very small subset of that. So there's not that many people that are actually specialized to understand the needs for a cafe. So, you know, when you're talking to your local water filter provider or servicer, you know, their primary business might be swimming pools or it might be dealing with domestic water heaters or it could be cooling towers. It could be a lot of things. Probably isn't specialty coffee. So it's worth taking a time to Investigate as possible as much as possible with whoever you're dealing with, but it is one of the challenges that we face. That's kind of the the basic introduction to reverse osmosis. Um, and at this point, I'd like to open it up to some Q and A. We've gone about 20 minutes, um, and I know that went really quick. And I know it didn't cover a lot of the the really in depth technical aspects of the of the uh, of ROs, but it's a good starting place because we all have to start from somewhere. Hey, Scott, could you speak to the waste? Explain the waste part. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, can you hear me okay? Can you explain the waste, just for our viewers, can you explain the ratio, the, the, the waste part coming off of the membrane? Yeah, absolutely. So the way that works is you have water that comes in as feed water. The water is then separated into two streams by the membrane. And depending on a whole number of technical factors with your RO system, only a percentage of the water is going to be produced as pure purified water. In older systems, it's about a four to one product to water waste ratio. So four gallons of water literally down the drain for every one gallon um, of water created. However, modern RO systems and modern membranes, especially in the last 15 years, have reduced that rate waste ratio pretty far down. Um, they're industrial, most large-scale industrial RO systems. If you're, if you're, if anyone's concerned about, it, like if you live in an area of California where they use desalinization, which is just RO to, to desalinate seawater, those waste something like ounces per gallon. So they actually recover most of the water as pure water, and the rest of it is very little waste. Um, but in the, uh, in the RO systems, the sizing that we're using for cafes, which is either something that's like a beefed up home system or a light commercial system, there's not as many controls in the process. So it's it's really important that you have somebody who can service the equipment appropriately to make sure it's it's functioning because it doesn't have a lot of internal controls and it's very dependent upon having a proper installation to reduce the amount of wastewater. I would say that if you're purchasing a commercial system today, um, depending on how much you spend and how big of a system you need, you can probably expect that the waste ratio would still be in the range of two gallons to three gallons to one on the high side. Um, but there's some very good, you know, very efficient systems out there by manufacturers that waste less than a gallon of water for every gallon that they make. In addition to that, um, you know, if you're in an area where you're just dealing with hard water, 
um, the primary thing. A lot of times you're actually just blending some you know, pre-RO water with post-RO water. So it's not as though all of the water, so you're actually not wasting quite as much water because you're not using, you're not ROing all of the water, if that makes some sense. Um, yeah, Scott, so I think that was one of the things I wanted to touch on there. As you mm -hmm. kind of talk about RO water is sort of this pure um, water that removes about everything. You know, and, and you can speak to probably what that means a little bit better, but we know that coffee recipe water needs some minerals um, and some hardness to, to make the coffee taste good, right? So I think you touched on it a little bit about blending, but there's a couple of options there. Mm -hmm. And how to, um, if, if you were to, uh, well, I guess we're talking to technicians. So it, as we think about what system is appropriate, um, how, how do you? decisions are you know blending or remineral remineralization or you know something around those lines well it really comes down to the application of the thing we're trying to solve for in our water so those two primary things that we encounter as equipment manufacturers uh is water hardness scaling right you know yeah. stops the equipment from working and the second one is corrosion Specifically, it's really going to be chlorides, although there's some parts of the country where really high sulfate levels can cause problems. Primarily, it's going to be chlorides. And so determining whether you can use blend back or not or blending is really going to be uh, conditioned on the, um, the mass concentration of chloride in your water. So if you have high chlorides, blending back may not work because you'd just be reintroducing those chlorides. And at the same time, you'd be also reducing the alkalinity or bicarbonate of the water, which would uh, factor into how, how aggressive that chloride corrosion is going to be. So in those situations, generally speaking, if you've got a chloride level that exceeds um, like 50 ppm, it's going to be generally really hard to blend above that level, be able to blend back enough to get your mineral concentration to a sort of acceptable level and not introduce more chloride, the chlorides back into your water stream. So there's that's kind of the delineation there that I use. I mean, okay. at La Marzocco, we say that, you know, no chloride, you know, the chloride concentration limit is, is 30 parts per million. So if you had chlorides at 50 and you RO the water and blend half of it back, depending on what the TDS is, you know, you might be able to get it under that 30 with blend back, maybe. The other thing you want to be cautious of though, is that when you're testing water, remember it's like a snapshot. Like if I took a picture of myself today and I took a picture of myself a year from now and I didn't cut my hair, I'd look very different, you know. Uh, and in the same token, like with, with water uh, quality, it can shift. I, I can tell you from my own experience, and Caleb, I, I worked at Starbucks too. Um, I, inst I built a store um, out in Eastern Washington and I, at the time, you know, we would send little sample bottles off to a laboratory and they would, they would give us a result. And so I got the samples back and said, oh, great, I need some carbon filters and away we go. And eight months later, the equipment was completely trashed. And I was, I was, I was surprised. I was like, what happened? And, and that was the first time I actually contacted a local municipality to ask them this question. I was like, what went wrong here? And they said, oh, we're a tri-source water system. Basically, they said, we use three different sources of water throughout the year. The, the point in time in which you tested the water, the fall or whatever, they're like, yeah, the water's beautiful. We pulled out of the river. It's immaculate. <laughs> the other two times, we pulled out of this dirty old hole in the ground. <laughs> yeah. Or, or a swamp. You know, I'm like, what? <laughs> so um, in, addition, in addition to a water test, when evaluating your, your RO needs and whether or not you can use blend back, it's a good idea to get like your consumer confidence report or your local water report or even talk to your municipality. Oh, let me ask you a quick question. So if a customer can't use the blend back, what do mm -hmm. they do in that case? Wait, so mm -hmm. let's get Gary back on a lot of cameras. We can see him. Gary, can you jump back on and then go on, Scott? Sorry, Gary disappeared. Thanks, Gary. Go for it, Scott. Oh, yeah. I can't see any of you, so um, <laughs> the <laughs> screen has disappeared. Um, uh, yeah, so in that case, if you can't use blend back, you're going to want to use some sort of post-RO remineralization, and there's a number of solutions to that. The most common one that, that, that's employed, the traditional one, is calcite, which is calcium carbonate or just crushed marble inside of a filter you know, container vessel. Water passes through it, and depending on your contact time, 
um, and, and, and pH, uh, it will absorb about 40 ppm of COCA3, give or take. Sometimes it's a little higher. I've seen as high as 60, not super high. Honestly, that's, you know, I'm in, speaking from someone from Seattle, that's perfectly fine as, you know, our water here is like 35 parts per million total. And, and we don't seem to have a tr trouble opening cafes. Um, um, but, uh, but so there's calcite. The next one would be uh, Magox. Trade name is Corisex. It's magnesium oxide. That's used um, when you know, traditionally in water purification when you're dealing with very low pH, like pH of six or below, because uh, magnesium will, will resaturate that water to a much higher, more acceptable pH. And it, it does work well. And, and if you've read like uh, Water for Coffee, uh, Maxwell Colonna Dashwood and Chris Hendon's book, uh, they, they, they kind of key into magnesium as, as having, you know, more palatable extraction experience, if you will. Um, the one downside with magnesium oxide, if you're using it in a straight cartridge, not in a blend or anything, is that I don't know who's banging around in the background, but there's a lot of noise on my. Oh, sorry. My, Could, uh, I'll... Making breakfast. Um, <laughs> um, the one downside, the magnesium oxide, if you want to call it that, is that, and I've I've tested this myself. I've tested a few of these cartridges in sort of a lab setting just to see uh, where these kind of claims are. Is that um, it remineralizes very well, like it gets you into like this 85 to 100 ppm where a lot of cafes are really targeting kind of on the harder side. Um, unfortunately, uh, when a lot of people today, when they look at, at the SCA's water spec and they see that range, they see the upper limit of those ranges as being some sort of target they're trying to hit. I encounter this a lot when I'm consulting with people on water. Like, how do I get my water to 150 ppm? And I'm like, well, wait a second. Let's let's talk about what that those parts per million are before we try to target that. Um, but what I was going to say with magnesium oxide is, is that it remineralizes well at nominal flow rates to equipment. The only downside is, and, and most manufacturers will put this in their literature, is that you need to flush that cartridge every morning. That's because the water that sits in there, that liter or so of water, is going to super saturate. And I've tested this, and you'll get like water that comes out of like four or five hundred parts per million of magnesium. I don't know if that's a problem for the equipment because it doesn't have the same scaling factor as calcium. Uh, but it might throw off your dial in, you know, a little bit in the morning. If every morning you come in, you got this really high TDS water going through your equipment. I don't know. Um, but, you know, flushing that would obviously, you know, just a, a liter of water out every morning seems to eliminate that. I, I ran some tests myself and that seemed to hold pretty true. Um, so there's that. Next, we've got some other unique remineralization solutions in the marketplace. Um, third wave water is one. Um, they make a, they have a system that remineralizes from powder and they have one that's specific for espresso. And uh, I've worked with those guys and they're great, uh, enthusiastic. I'm not, I'm not pitching any one system, but it's, it's a really unique coffee focused solution. Uh, and that's something I think that that's good to have in the marketplace. Um, and there's been a few other liquid remin systems, uh, over the years, um, with more or less success. It's important to note, though, with re in any type of remineralization strategy or cartridge, that you uh, are aware of whatever is in that remineralization substance. A lot of alkaline filters that are sold on Amazon, for instance, contain sodium chloride. They contain salt. Chloride, if you don't know, uh, in small concentrations actually sweetens water. It improves the palatability of water. And if you're using it for cupping, it can actually mask roasting defects. So something to note there: that chloride removal isn't just for um, isn't just for the health of the equipment. It actually will help us produce better coffee. So, um, but yeah, it, there's no one easy solution to remineralization uh, because we all have different. We all want kind of different outcomes about that what that remineralization looks like and so sometimes people have realistic expectations and other times people don't a lot of it's driven by conversations that they have or or a lot of times it's because they've made batched water like in gallons that is really hard to reproduce on a an ongoing industrial scale um, for a cafe uh, but it tastes really good when you cup it 
So, you know, those are, that's the sort of subjective side of it. And that's usually where the conversation becomes more difficult. So, or the, the solution is. Well, so we're getting a lot of questions. So I want to make sure we make up through them. Um, and as we were kind of talking about systems, one of the first questions that came in uh, from Mitch Aspect was, uh, what's the difference between RO and CAPDI, CAPDI being uh, capacitive deionization? Well, the main difference is, is that um, in, in, with deionization, uh, capacitive deionization, and I think what they're alluding to is a, a system of electro uh, positive and negative plates in the water solution to remove water. And I've heard about this. Um, it's, it's a technology that's been sort of in development for the last couple of decades. And the promise being is that you waste less water. I've also heard claims that it uses less energy, but all the systems I've seen use a lot more energy than an RO system does, um, at least modern RO. Um, so, uh, and the only couple of demonstrations I've seen with capacitive deionization, um, we're just running water directly through a deionizer as a single stage solution. Now I worked for EcoWater Systems and we managed large scale uh, EDI systems for electronics washing. Um, we, we had a system that produced 60,000 gallons per day of laboratory grade water, which is um, um, very low. It's, it's, it's basically water is a pure insulator. Um, to get water to that stage, though, it can't be done in a single stage DI system. No, no single stage DI system will tolerate that. It just doesn't work like that. You would need a some sort of uh, ion exchange first. You generally RO the water before a deionizer in an industrial setting, um, and then um, and then process it further. Um, I would love to see one actually working that can produce water as efficiently at scale and economy but I haven't seen that actually happen. So, I mean, again, though, my experience is limited and I, I could be completely off base on that. I mean, I've, I've been known to be wrong <laughs> more than once, but, but that's my initial take on it. I tried to get more, more information about it, uh, but for the most part, it, it just hasn't been that forthcoming. I've got the garbage truck out front. If one of the panelists would like to ask a question, I'll keep muted while it passes. Yeah, I okay. got it. Um, to answer Jacob, Jacob is standard asks a very big question is, can you go over basic components? Jacob, we're going to have a separate episode that will go over that, um, that I'll actually go in detail. And once we have that episode, I'll make sure you get a direct email. Uh, Mike Kahn from La Marzocco has a question. Uh, do you have any examples of waste, sorry, <laughs> wastewater being used for something else rather than going straight to the drain? Oh, absolutely. This is a great question. This is a huge concern within the water industry is how do we, you know, how do we, how do we use water? And I can tell you from my own experience, having worked in water for coffee and in industrial water here in Washington state, you know, up until very recently, uh, it was actually illegal to reuse that wastewater, believe it or not. Gray water systems were completely illegal. Rain barrels were completely illegal, and that has to do with water rights. And that was only something that's changed in the last five years. Um, the other issue with reusing wastewater that I've run into is, at least here in the United States, our plumbing systems and our wa municipal water systems are designed to have water flowing in only one direction and only being used one time. So it's pretty difficult, even if it's legal, to install a gray water system uh, to recapture that water, like to plummet to your toilets or your mop sink or something else, even though there's nothing wrong with it, it's completely sanitary. Um, it can be hard to convince a building inspector of such and allow you to install that. Um, I A couple of years ago, some good friends of mine, I, I helped them uh, redesign a very old cafe that just needed a complete update and we redid all the plumbing, I did all the plumbing design, modernized everything we put in on a modern ro system and i thought well this is this is a perfect opportunity to pitch let's put in a recirculation and re waste reusage system bought all the components and sure enough the plumbing inspector even though it's completely legal this is all ul approved stuff plumbing code and everything wouldn't let us do it specifically for the reason that he believed that you know once it's used it can't go it can't be returned back for usage for the public 
but this is totally something that has it's really rooted in regulation and sort of a, a bit of friction between municipal water operators uh, the municipal water treatment uh, kind of side and the, the point of use side at least here in the United States but there are absolutely ways that that water can be reused uh, in, 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 but we need to change kind of the mindset and regulation about how we use water, at least here in this country, um, so that we maximize that. Um, also, I think it has something to do with the fact that the your plumbing inspector works for, at least here in the United States, is going to work for the city. The city usually supplies your water. They make money selling you water, although, you know, depending on where you are, it's more or less. Uh, so they have a sort of, you know, vested interest in making sure you're using the most amount of water possible. And I, there is a sanitary argument to it, but again, water that passes through an RO system doesn't become unsanitary as wastewater. It's right. just concentrated minerals. That that Thanks, helps kind of address yeah. that. Yeah, actually, that really explains it. Actually, I didn't know that. Um, hey, Gary, you said early on you had a couple questions. Do you want to ask your questions? Yeah, I've got one uh, question for um, Scott, and that's around additional storage. Um, mm -hmm. Usually, with an RO system, you'll have additional storage to, um, uh, you know, build up a supply of water for, for busy periods. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have a ratio or rule of thumb that you normally would advise to text that, that would suggest above this usage, you need to get additional storage and this is this is the sort of capacity it needs to have? Yeah, that's a good question. I, a lot of it has to do with, with two, you know, again, the amount of water you're using, using. And then RO systems, and this gets into a more technical aspect of sizing, specking installation RO systems, but there is an argument to be made that you don't want your RO system too small because obviously it would have to work all the time regardless of your storage capacity. It would basically run all the time to keep refilling that. But you also don't want your RO system too big. You actually don't want it to make water too fast uh, because in that instance, there are, there's, there's some other technical aspects about that, about the way reverse osmosis works where that, that has downsides. When it comes to how much storage you need, you know, most cafes don't really use a ton of filtered water at a single time. An espresso machine especially doesn't. But um, there's sort of a ratio between the amount of water that you need and the amount of water the RO system can produce in time uh, and that storage. And we can, I'm not actually, I, I don't exactly know you know, they need a specific scenario in order to address that. But, you know, you can do a little bit of math and everything and kind of get a sense of, you know, based upon how the RO system functions, how much water you need. And I keep repeating myself, but um, yeah, there's an answer to that. Uh, I'm not, I don't think I could answer in a very small amount of time, though. That's the thing. Thanks, Kyle. Um, Maybe that's a topic, a uh, subject uh, in its own right, then, Scott, one day. It is, yeah, I think sizing is a is a really interesting concept and it and it like to Scott's point, I think it changes for the based on the what you're trying to treat and how much water you're using in a day and potentially in your most busy time. Uh, you know, if you're undersized for your peak time, you really can't, you know, get through that moment that you need it the most, right? Yeah. Whole other episode. <laughs> And you, you may be wondering, because the question's out there, well, what about, um, you know, there are tankless systems? And if you're wondering, I've installed a number of them. Um, about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there was a system called the GE Merlin, which is a tankless RO system. It can produce, you know, a stream of water at about four gallons per minute. It's freaking amazing. Um, but as you can imagine, without a storage tank, you're going to have some um, TDS creep every time the system turns on and off. And in a cafe setting, your your water demand isn't constant. It's up and down and up and down, water being turned off and turned off, which is going to force that system to turn on and turn off constantly. They work better where you need a lot of water over a given produced over a given period of time. So storage tanks not only contribute to uh, having a volume of water that you need, it also can it also improves the purity of that water and consistency of that water by having the appropriate sized tank. Hey, Scott, I have a question. Since we're all on the West Coast, how much attention are we paying on maintaining that RO system now that we're kind of in permanent drought conditions? Because we've got such, such differences in water quality. Well, I think we're probably going to see a lot of pressure put upon, you know, from, from local water to, um, 
local water suppliers to make sure that your water usage is as minimal as possible. And so that's where proper maintenance comes into play. You know, an improperly or infrequently serviced RO may waste a ton of water. You know, you can get um, uh, all kinds of little things can go wrong with your RO system that if it's not caught within a period of time can cause the thing, to, the system performance to massively degrade. Um, you know, for instance, uh, you clog a restrictor uh, post RO in your concentrate stream, which is going to create increased pressure on the membrane. Well, then foul the membrane quicker. Well, then you go back and you either have to replace the membrane or clean it, or you may go in and adjust the drain to waste ratio to improve the product water performance. But then you're wasting more water to get the same period of water that you were previously getting wasting less. That's just one example. Um, so I think that, that that's that's an important um, point is that poor maintenance or and and again poor installation. So like for instance, what if your water pressure to your building drops? Uh, this is a common thing that that I see uh, when investigating issues for customers is that uh, there are their water pressure the building for some reason dropped dramatically and the RO system quit functioning or didn't function quite to the level it needed to, and then downstream it caused a problem with their equipment. They're only reporting the equipment got damaged, but when we usually investigate those issues, we can go back and go, oh, well, the RO system wasn't working optimally, and it wasn't working optimally because the incoming building water supply was at 30 PSI. Well, why was that? Well, no one was checking it. Um, so, you know, that's generally what it comes down to. RO systems that are regularly, you know, maintained usually don't have this problem they're, they're pretty reliable because you catch that stuff soon enough all right we got um, three more questions from the audience i'd like to get through and we've got about 13 minutes left in the in the episode so um this one's okay pretty good one uh does ro replace water softening uh from ann and i'm sorry ann i couldn't see your last name in the in the chat but uh can you take that one scott yeah, real simple. RO systems can replace softening. Um, generally speaking, though, an RO system, and this is a general rule, but but mostly true because the RO systems that we use, the, the, the material in the membrane is polyamide. Um, it has a slight ionic charge, so it will attract cations like calcium and will foul easily. So at hardness levels below 170 parts per million or 10 grains per gallon, um, an RO system will work very efficiently as a demineralizer or softening treatment. When you get above 10 grains per gallon, generally speaking, you're going to want us, and this is true, this is how we do it in industrial water, we soften the water first and then run it through the R to reduce that total dissolved solids. So it can replace a softener um, in some circumstances, but when you get into very hard water, you're going to end up with a softener anyway. So I hope that kind of answers it. Yeah, that's that's perfect. And I think sometimes, um, and, may, and and I might have been reading when you said this, Scott, but sometimes it's necessary to also, or or it's helpful to have a softener before your RO system in some very uh, complex situations to yeah, help that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, an RO originally was designed purely for saltwater desalinization. So usually they're, they're oftentimes referred to in the literature as a desalinator or demineralizer. So they do very well at removing seawater. They don't do as well at removing very hard water or you know demineralizing very hard water so that's where the softener comes into play and there are also other types of pretreatments you may need to put in pre-ro uh very specifically to deal with say iron um or um there are i mean there are other things that besides just softening that that sometimes are employed so yeah I think that's a great segue to the next question. What factors have a direct impact impact on uh, output um, from William? You mean in terms of RO performance? I think that's what it sounds like. Uh, yeah. In a question directly, but it, yeah, like you know, I guess how can you judge how efficient your system is going to be based on the water test you've done? And maybe that's a good way to. Uh, yeah, sort of absolutely. Sort of That's the starting point. So once you have like really defined numbers about what the water is you're going to be treating, you can then design the system around that. Now this gets into some really technical aspects about how membranes behave, how they perform in, in, in the environment. And what I will say to that without getting too technical is that 
with the types of systems that we use in cafes, the size, you know, cost, whatever, the installation and the the um, understanding of, of that is is probably the most determinant factor in RO performance. The, the Like I previously said, the most common thing we see is low water pressure. Low water pressure will lead to poor performance or the system simply not working. And so if that's not addressed, the RO won't solve that problem. Um, so, or for instance, if you're in an area where there's just a lot of uh, solid particles, you know, uh, not dissolved solids, but actually, you know, colloidals and things like that, you know, silts and things like that, you should be changing your pre-filters more often, or maybe you need more pre-filters, you know. Um, so again, it all comes down to that initial setup. If it's done correctly, um, yeah, it, it'll all work. But more often than not, we see RO systems as simply another product to buy, and you people go on to Webstaurant and they compare one RO system to the other RO system, and it probably comes down to cost and size and things like that. Uh, many of them will also say it's for you know for coffee or it's advertised for coffee, so they'll use that as a factor and determinant. But those really aren't the appropriate things to use. There really is you, you need a technician on site to really evaluate your entire plumbing system and to make sure that the installation goes smoothly because there's so many other things that can go wrong with that. Um, so, Yeah, water is definitely a complex subject that uh, we could talk about for, for a very long time. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, last, I, yeah, go ahead. This last uh, question from Vladimir, um, and I love this kind of segues nicely. So as technicians, is there, you know, some online training you know, how, how can we go learn more uh, about how to um, understand this this topic better and be able to speak to it, you know, to our customers? So is there a space that you can go find out more? Is there training online? Is there somewhere we can look to to, to um, educate ourselves? Yeah, there are some online solutions. The Probably the biggest one is the WQA or the Water Quality Association. Um, when I worked for a WQA, company uh, manufacturer um, it wasn't online and so all that stuff was done with like CDs and like books and stuff and now they've basically moved everything into an online platform there is some cost involved with it and one thing I'll note about those training classes is that um, it's not specific to coffee so you're gonna learn a lot about stuff that you may not really want to know <laughs> Or it may not seem like you. There's an easy way to connect the dots between the information you're being given and what you really want to be able to apply in the field. So I will say there's a and a lot of information in that. Um, and and we've we've investigated here at La Marzocco. Well, maybe we can take part of that, or we can work with them to develop something. And so far, we haven't gotten there yet. I think that this um, uh, the the coffee technicians guild will be a good forum for that because we're we're really focused on on the needs of cafes uh, whereas most of the what rest of the water industry while there is some you know uh some definitely some great people out there and great companies who are investing time and energy and resources into our our market um there's still not a lot of it you know what i mean so um apart from that is is, is there one resource where i go to not really i mean I, I learned this stuff the hard way. I was basically, you know, like <laughs> Caleb, I worked for Starbucks and they basically just sent me out and said, yeah, go solve this problem, figure it out. Cause they had no idea either. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Remember, remember those early days when they thought all the water in the world looked just like Seattle water. Exactly. And there's, they're not <laughs> the only company that still does that. So yeah. um, what I can tell you is if you've seen some of our other series and some of the other articles I've written, what I would start with is, Become familiar with testing water. That's the most important thing yeah. is having accurate information to work off of instead of, um, you know, because a lot of times people come to me as the water quality specialist at La Marzocco asking questions about how they can get their water for their cafe to a particular thing that they believe is going to be best for their coffee. Most of the time yeah. they've read water for coffee and they have this, they have no idea about the water chem. They still don't have an idea about the water chemistry after reading that book. Um, well, I I quote you all the time on these seminars because uh, I remember you said early on in one of the early ones, like just keep testing over and over again, and you will begin to formulate uh, an understanding of the water in your organization. And I think that stretches way deeper into our industry. If we're, if we're documenting and we're paying attention and we're looking at these things over and over again, 
we will slowly begin to understand what we're looking at. Even you know, knowing that the resources for us to educate are, are out there, but challenging to um, uh, to get to sometimes. So we only have about five minutes left. I want to give the panel a little time um, to ask a question. So I'm going to start with Gary, and uh, let's see if we can get your burning question for Scott, and uh, and then get Highland in here as well before we have to sign off. Okay. Yeah, I've got one other question that kind of follows along from one of the um, audience questions which is around uh, efficiency. So mm -hmm. if you've got a, a, an RO that's installed in a cafe that's maybe in an area, part of the, uh, the country, that's very hot in the summer, very cold in the winter, does that impact at all on the efficiency of the RO and how it operates? I suppose it could if you saw a, a, a big change in water temperature. RO systems and RO efficiency numbers that you see published are all based upon a single temperature, 25 degrees centigrade. That's what's considered laboratory grade water, or lab well, laboratories, because the temperature is is very uh, determined upon how water uh, is and behaves. So that is an important question. Although most of the time your water is between a certain range, it, the water coming out of the, your tap is almost always too cold for an RO system. So they kind of adjust or compensate for that in other ways. Does that kind of answer it? Yeah, it's just that we've had some instances where people say, well, uh, it, the viscosity of the water changes in different times of the year, and therefore it affects the, uh, you know, the efficiency of the RO. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If it's th it makes sense, Scott. If, it's th if the temperature's within a certain range, which the manufacturer would have uh, considered, it shouldn't be too much of an effect. But if there's, if there's huge spikes, then maybe, maybe um, that, that has a bigger effect. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why you see RO systems being spec at like 500 or 700 gallons per day, and you're like, God, nobody uses that much water. Well, it's not really true. That that spec is only true if the water's at 77 or 25 degrees C and all the other parameters are met, but we know most of the time it isn't, so we spec a larger system that works less efficiently. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Scott. All right. A uh, couple more minutes. Kurt, any burning questions for Scott? Get off mute, Kurt. You and your mute. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> well, you guys don't want to hear me coughing and clearing my throat right now. Doing right In now, case anybody's season. concerned, Kurt does that at every meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so going back to the when you were talking about the try water, and I actually have a couple municipalities that I have to deal with that try water and does that have much effect on the ROs? Does it, like if you're one of these guys that set up an RO and just leave it, how much effect does that have on the RO if you're not checking that constantly and making sure you're going, okay, I'm tuning the blend back or uh, I'm tuning the output. How much effect does that have on it? Oh, it's huge. Yeah. If you have a, a multi-source water, you know, seasonal water changes, you're going to have to up the maintenance game and definitely up your testing a bit. You're going to have to want to understand when that changes and what to do about it. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the case of where uh, the, the example I gave, I ended up going back and spending thousands of dollars to correct that problem because what I needed to do was I needed to spec a system for the worst case scenario. You know what I mean? You have to basically yeah. build the system and maintain it as if you're always doing with the worst water. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, if you guys can go a little over, uh, I think Highland will keep the meeting open. I have a hard stop at nine to go into a, another uh, meeting. So um, Highland, I think you're last for the question. And if I don't see you, thanks, thanks to the whole panel. And Scott, thanks for sharing all of your wisdom and experience over the years. It's all, always a great show to have, have you here and talk about water. Highland? Thank you. Um, we'll address a couple more questions. My question, I realize, is a whole other episode. Um, to speak to Courtney's uh, comment, Courtney, if you send over the information on RO-specific training, this group will make sure it gets distributed. So just use my email for it, and we're happy to put it out there. Um, William Hinton asked a question, and he bailed, but I think it's a good question to ask. Is, is that Courtney from Pentair? That's Courtney from Pentair. She's a big fan was, of us. She was on here? Hey, Courtney. Dude. Dude, wow. you, Scott, you, we have you, we have we have fans. Like we get the same fifty people from around the world. Apparently, the entire nation, the entire the Greek, the entire Greek nation watches us. I don't know why, 
but like Greek and Spain really love us. So Courtney, if you get your if you get your stuff over to us, we'll distribute to the group. William Hidden had a question, which I think is a really good question: is the impact of temperature and back pressure on back on output rates? Yeah, that was kind of going to uh, ties into uh, what Gary was saying. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, temperature, of course, uh, greatly affects the performance of the membrane. So essentially, you know, uh, it's spec'd at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's what your actual your performance numbers for your RO is based upon. But if you um, if if the water temperature is is lower than that, right, you're going to end up with less production. So typical water is like around 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, I think, coming out of a sink. So you can expect your, let's, let's just use 100 as a round number. If you have a 100 gallon per day RO system, and it makes 100 gallons per day at 77 degrees Fahrenheit at 50 degrees, it's probably making like 45 gallons per day or 40. The only way to overcome that, of course, is to increase the net driving pressure across the membrane to compensate for that lower temperature, okay. which usually involves a pump. And that gets into some whole other weird physics about the way membranes behave that people, it's a little counterintuitive unless you understand. So basically so, yeah. one of the determinations of this episode is we could do an entire series of Ask the Pro on water. <laughs> yeah, no, completely. And you know, membranes as they come in a system, generally, like I said, these systems we have don't have a lot of tuning mechanisms in them. So it's really right. installation dependent. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Let's do one more round, Robin, before we wrap it up. Gary, do you have another question? Uh, I think Scott's covered off all the questions that I had already. Okay. Mr. Benedict, how about you? I'm good. Okay. Scott, any closing statements before I do the close? Any, anything else before I close out? Oh, just thanks, guys, so much for having me. I, I really, I think this is great to have this interest in 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 the water side of it because we know as technicians how much it plays a part in, in the success of our cafes and our customers. And so I really appreciate everyone taking the time to come listen to little old me who, you know, like I said, I'm school of hard knocks. I didn't go to school for this stuff. I'm terrible. I muddle it. I make mistakes all the time. And <laughs> if anything, if anything that's encouraging to you out there as you go on this journey of water, just know that if, if I can get there, you can definitely get there. And, and if you're going to make some mistakes, that's okay. It's going to happen. No big deal. Like I have done so much crazy stuff. Uh, that didn't work out to get to where I am now. <laughs> so, that, Thanks, that's Scott. Yeah. so you guys, thank you and your employers so, so much for taking the time out to um, let you work with us. Scott, if you would uh, send me over the presentation so I can post. Um, we have one episode left in this season next week, which is Roasting Repair Basics, which will be Doug Graff, Marty Rowe, um, Arno Holsuch, and then this some of this group will be attending, and um, we're well, looking forward to seeing you. And that, with that, gentlemen, have a great weekend. Take care of yourselves, and we will see you next week. Have Thanks, everyone. Thank Take you. care, Hannah. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.